carbon metabolism from the perspective of using up the products of photosynthesis. So in the daytime in the chloroplast, the main products of photosynthesis that are being produced are triose phosphates. And what we want to finish up from lecture topic 10 are what are the fates of this triose phosphate as far as the plant is concerned. And we briefly discussed at the beginning of lecture topic 10, or I think lecture topic 9, where these triose phosphates go. Ultimately, where most of them are going to go are to produce sucrose in the cytoplasm that will then be exported to the rest of the plant. So all the non-photosynthetic parts of the plant and all the plant at nighttime has to rely on carbon that's derived from photosynthesis, both for carbon skeletons, for synthesis of other molecules, and for energy from respiration. So we also talked about the fact that some of that carbon in, that's produced by the, by the dark reactions needs to be stored as starch in the chloroplast so that starch can be broken down and used as carbon skeletons as an, and as an energy resource at night. So photosynthesis, photosynthesis obviously can't happen at night, so the temporary storage of carbon in the form of starch in the daytime provides a source for carbon metabolism at night. And again, that's broken down. It can be used in these cells or it can be exported as sucrose. So we really need to be thinking about the reactions that are involved in starch synthesis in the daytime. We'll cover that in just a minute. Sucrose synthesis and starch breakdown at night. We'll cover the starch breakdown at night when we cover respiration, but we'll cover sucrose and starch synthesis today. Okay, we talked about starch synthesis as fulfilling two um, particular roles. One of these is it's a carbon source for the cells at night. carbon in terms of reduced carbon. It's really for the whole plant at night. But the other thing we talked about, I briefly mentioned at the end of the last lecture, was that the ability to synthesize starch represents an overflow mechanism where excess products of, of, the, of photosynthesis that can't be used for sucrose synthesis can be stored away as starch to allow photosynthesis to continue. So we call this an overflow mechanism. Using up excess products of photosynthesis during the daytime, storing them as starch. And ultimately that will be broken down at other times when that starch is needed. Okay, so obviously there has to be some mechanism that's controlling the partitioning of triose phosphate between export to the cytoplasm and using in sucrose biosynthesis and production of starch. And we'll talk briefly about those now. And in addition, the study question for today's lecture topic is focusing on control of the key enzyme associated with starch biosynthesis and how these two different responsibilities, if you wish, of that particular enzyme are regulated. I ask you to think about that. Okay, so when we talk about starch, there's really two types of starch. Amylose, which is a linear glucose polymer, and amylopectin, which is a branched polymer. What's the advantage of storing carbon in the form of starch as opposed to, for example, storing it as glucose or sucrose? What's the advantage as far as cells are concerned? Big advantage of starch. <laughs> 
actually, much of starch is soluble. You can make starch granules that are insoluble, but a lot of the starch that's stored in the chloroplast is soluble as well. But that's certainly one part of it. But take that one step further, Francesca. Yeah, it's not osmotically active, right? So one starch molecule could be made up of 100,000 glucose molecules. That's 100,000 times less osmotically active, right? Because it goes by the number of molecules, not by the size of the molecule. Right? So it's not osmotic. That's a really important reason for storing starch. OK, so let's look at the mechanism by which, sorry, I can't point at the computer. I've got to point up here, by which starch is synthesized in the chloroplast. And the key enzyme that's involved in starch biosynthesis is an enzyme that takes a glucose phosphate, glucose 1-phosphate, and reacts it with ATP. And normally when we think about an enzyme using ATP, that ATP sticks a phosphate group on. This enzyme does just the opposite. This enzyme sticks an ADP onto the glucose and throws the phosphate out. So it takes the phosphate off the glucose and takes a phosphate from the ATP and makes a, two phosphates joined together called pyrophosphate, but sticks ADP onto the glucose. And in fact, if you know biochemistry, sticking an ADP or a UTDP or something like that onto a sugar molecule or onto other molecules is a way of activating that molecule for biosynthetic reactions. So in fact, this is relatively common. So we, we can think of as ADP glucose as being primed to be used in formation of a polymer, right? And obviously the next step then is going to be to take ADP glucose and react it with a polymer of glucose. This N down here can be a very large number. A polymer of glucose where it adds one more glucose onto the end of this polymer. Okay, so two enzymes involved with this, one that forms ADP glucose, called ADP glucose pyrophosphorylase, and then the enzymes that stick ADP glucose onto the end of a starch polymer, and there's actually several of these. This is the key enzyme that's involved in regulating how much carbon is being partitioned into starch. And as I said, the study question for today, for today's lecture topic, asks you to think about the mechanism by which the two reasons that starch is being stored away, either for use at night or for an overflow mechanism, how these two things are regulated independently by this same enzyme. Okay? So there's details in the question that will be helpful for you. Okay, so the synthesis of starch represents one of the we should say obligatory sinks for triose phosphates in the chloroplast. That is, under conditions, normal conditions, at least some of that product is being stored away as starch to be used at night. But the majority of that, that um, triose phosphate is being exported from the chloroplast into the cytoplasm to be used for largely for sucrose biosynthesis. So let's turn our attention to the sucrose biosynthesis, oh, sorry, one, one more thing I want to talk about. I'll mention this briefly now. We'll come back to talk much more about this, um, these reactions when we talk about respiration. One of the things that's important in carbon metabolism is to recognize, we talked about it when we talked about the Calvin cycle, that changing sugars around, so taking two, three carbon sugars and making a six carbon sugar, or taking a six and a four and making two fives. Moving carbons around is relatively easy. And the central part of this moving carbons around is an equilibrium between triose phosphates and hexose phosphates. And this is a figure from your textbook. And the reason I wanted to mention something about it, well, as I said, we'll come, come back and talk a lot more detail about this when we talk about respiration. But this figure is very misleading because it suggests that the equilibrium between triose phosphates happens in the chloroplast and the equilibrium between the hexose phosphates, the six carbon sugars, happens in the cytoplasm. That's incorrect. The triose phosphate and hexose phosphate equilibrium happen both in the chloroplast 
and in the cytoplasm. So you mean there's both in cytoplasm and in the cell? Yep, yep. So the enzymes that are involved in all of these reactions are there's isoforms that are present in the chloroplast and different isoforms that are present in the cytoplasm. And it should be clear to you, well, maybe not so much now, but after we do the respiration lecture, that the regulation of these enzymes in their role, for example, in the chloroplast, the triose phosphate, in order to make starch, has to make glucose 1-phosphate. This is the thing that reacts with ATP to make ADP glucose. So these reactions have to be able to happen in the um, chloroplast. We'll see in just a second that making both fructose 6-phosphate and glucose 1-phosphate are required for sucrose biosynthesis in the cytoplasm. So this interplay between triose phosphates and hexose phosphates is a common component of all carbon metabolism in the cytoplasm and in the chloroplasts. Okay, so don't take this figure from the textbook at face value. The, these reactions happen in the cytoplasm and the chloroplast. These reactions happen in the cytoplasm and the chloroplast. And as I said, we'll see that they're central in regulating the overall flow of carbon, largely between photosynthesis and respiration. Okay? All right. Uh, so let's go back now and look at the part of this overall picture associated with sucrose biosynthesis. Because I said, under most circumstances, that's going to be the primary sink for the products of photosynthesis uh, in the daytime taking those triose phosphates, making sucrose, and exporting that sucrose to the rest of the plant. The enzymes involved in sucrose biosynthesis are very similar to those that are involved in starch biosynthesis. In starch, remember, it was taking uh, glucose 1-phosphate and adding uh, ADP to it to make ADP glucose. Well, in uh, sucrose biosynthesis, substitute UD, UTP for ATP. So the key uh, reaction that's involved in the synthesis of sucrose is activating the glucose molecule so it can polymerize with the fructose to make sucrose. So the key enzyme is the ADP, the UTP glucose pyrophosphorylase that makes UDP glucose that then reacts with fructose to make sucrose, it actually makes sucrose phosphate and then the phosphate has to be hydrolyzed from it. So a very similar pathway except for rather than making a long chain polymer, you're making just a two, a two hexo sugar, a, um, a disaccharide. Okay, so it shouldn't be surprising to you if you think about how starch metabolism is regulated in the chloroplast, as I asked you to do for the study question for today, that the same enzymes, or very similar enzyme, is involved in the regulation of sucrose biosynthesis in the cytoplasm. Okay. So don't treat these as two completely separate things. First of all, the enzymes, the key enzymes involved in the regulation of both of these processes are very similar to each other. They obviously have the same evolutionary origin. But at the same time, these two processes are also, I won't say competing with each other, but they're using up the majority of the, the triose phosphates. It would be better to say that they're complementary to each other. If the rate of one goes down, the rate of the other one is going to go up in a complementary way. Okay, let's finish this up by trying to pull this all together and look at, so here's triose phosphates that are coming out of the Calvin cycle. And we talked about some of that triose phosphate going to make starch in the chloroplast and some of that triose phosphate coming in the cytoplasm to make sucrose in the cytoplasm. Hemi. So why make sucrose? Why make sucrose? Why, why make sucrose? Why make sucrose? Why do plants make sucrose in the leaves? What do they do with that sucrose? Is it just used for carbon source in the mesophyll cells? What's, what happens to most of that sucrose? Stephen? Uh, 
Yeah, it's transported from the leaves to the rest of the plant. Why can't they transport triose phosphate? Yeah, or why can't? That's a good question. Why can't they tri transport triose phosphate or glucose, for example? Anybody, want, anybody know the answer or want to take a guess? The sucrose has more carbons than um, triose Yeah, so it's a sucrose is equivalent to four triose phosphates, so... Yep. So osmotic, uh, osmotic characteristics play a role in that. But then you could say, well, why don't we, some plants transport um, trisaccharides and four saccharides and five saccharides. Why don't they do that instead of sucrose? There's another important consideration we'll talk about when we, when we discuss in, in the next lecture topic on Thursday when we talk about phloem transport, stability. Sucrose is less reactive than glucose or triose phosphates. That is, if it's going to take hours to transport glucose from the leaves to the roots and there's competing reactions, then it's better to transport something that doesn't react very much than something that does react a lot. So one of the main reasons that sucrose is transported is because it's relatively unreactive. For those of you that have taken organic chemistry, you know that the oxygen atoms that are involved in forming the polymer between two glucoses or between glucose and fructose is relatively reactive. It's called a hemiacetal. Um, when you, to, one of the assays you do for glucose is the reduction of, car, of uh, copper. It's because that hemiacetal oxygen is a lot more reactive. When you, when you form sucrose, the two hemiacetals on glucose and fructose form a bond together. They're no longer there. So fructose is, or sorry, sucrose is much less reactive. That's the main reason why. Okay. All right, so back to what, we're, what I wanted to finish up talking about here. And that is the one thing that we haven't really considered in this is how does triose phosphate get out of the chloroplast and into the cytoplasm? Obviously, it can't just cross chloroplast envelope because it's a relatively, it's a charged molecule. It's got a phosphate group on it, so it's got negative charges. It's not going to just move across the, the, um, the chloroplast envelope. So you might expect that there'd be some sort of a transport protein, a carrier protein. But it turns out that the, the carrier protein that functions here is an obligate antiporter. What it does is it transports so here's the chloroplast envelope. It transports triose phosphate out in exchange for inorganic phosphate moving in. It's a triose phosphate phosphate antiporter. Why does that make sense? Why can't you just have a triose phosphate transporter allowing the triose phosphate to go out? Why antiport with phosphate? Why does that make sense? So that you don't run out of phosphate in some Yeah, that's basically it, right? Because every time you make triose phosphate and export it, you're taking a phosphate out of the chloroplast. Is phosphate important in the chloroplast? Yeah, you need phosphate to make ADP into ATP so you can make the dark reactions work, right? So maintaining the phosphate balance in the chloroplast by requiring for every triose phosphate that goes out and the inorganic phosphate goes back in is extremely important. So this antiporter is playing an important role in maintaining the ability of photosynthesis to continue. If it didn't do this, the chloroplast would under, under high rates of photosynthesis would run out of phosphate. Yep. Um, but these are ions. Well, phosphate is an ion, and triose phosphate is an ion too. I mean, it's just a three carbon sugar with a phosphate group stuck on it. It has a negative charge associated with it. It's just a much bigger molecule. And what about this? This has a negative charge as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 
So the difference is that the antiporters we talked about before, one of the things that was transported was always a hydrogen ion, right? It was using the energy of a hydrogen ion gradient to pump other things. This is just an exchange thing. There's no, there's no um, energy being used from a proton gradient to make this work. It's the gradients of triose phosphate and inorganic phosphate that make it work. Now, it turns out that this transporter plays a tremendously important role in regulating the rates of photosynthesis. And I don't want to, I'm going to give you the scenario rather than asking you about it um, because it's, it's not complicated, but it takes a while to think it through. Let's think about the case where photosynthesis is operating quickly. So we got light reaction, CO2 fixation, and all lots of carbon being transported out to the cytoplasm to be made into sucrose, and that sucrose being transmitted to the rest of the plant, transported to the rest of the plant. So we have high rates of sucrose synthesis in the chloroplasts. We've got all these various intermediates between, between the triose phosphates and sucrose. Notice that all of these intermediates are phosphorylated. And or, <coughs> excuse me, in order to have high rates of sucrose biosynthesis, what do the concentrations of these intermediates have to be, high or low? Or doesn't it matter? Why? What, that's correct, but why do you say that? <laughs> okay, remember this? Right? Every enzyme behaves this way. The higher the concentrations of its substrate, the faster the rate, or you could turn it around. If you went to have high rates of any of those enzymes, you need to have more of those substrates around. Are these each of these substrates for the next enzyme? So what's going to happen to the concentration of these substrates, these intermediates, if the rate of sucrose biosynthesis is high? Are these concentrations of these substrates going to be high or low? High. What's going to happen, so that means that a lot of the phosphate in the cytoplasm is being tied up in these intermediates. What happens to the concentration of free phosphate in the cytoplasm when sucrose synthesis is high? It decreases, right? Because all that phosphate is tied up in these phosphorylated intermediates. If the concentration of phosphate in the cytoplasm goes down, what happens to the rate of triose phosphate export from the chloroplast? It also has to go down, right? If this is limited to go back in, then triose phosphate goes out. So it turns out that under conditions where there's high rates of sucrose synthesis, the activity of this transporter is often what limits photosynthesis because so much phosphate is tied up in the cytoplasm in the intermediates associated with sucrose biosynthesis. We'll come back in just a minute when we talk about curves like this for photosynthesis, the limiting factors at, at high light intensity. This is a key limiting factor in photosynthesis. Not so much this protein, but the function of this protein when phosphate is limiting, then triose phosphate has a harder time getting out. And phosphate becomes limiting whenever these intermediates build up, whenever there's high rates of sucrose biosynthesis. So make sure that that makes sense to you. Think it through. This is the sort of understanding that I want you to be able to grasp when we talk about how photosynthesis fits together with respiration and nitrogen metabolism and things like that. You've got to see these interactions that play key roles in how photosynthesis is regulated. Okay? So if you have questions, we can ask questions now before we go on. If you're not sure about it later on, come see me or Simon in office hours. Okay? So we're going to move on to the next topic now.
Okay, so this is, this is going to be sort of the summary of photosynthesis. We've had four lectures on photosynthesis now, and um, this is going to pull a lot of the things that we talked about together. So it's an, an important lecture in terms of not so much memorizing a lot of information, but practicing bringing that information together to answer physiological questions. Okay. So one of the main things we're going to talk about today is how light and photosynthesis interact. In, and in some senses, we can treat photosynthesis totally as a black box. Light comes in and sugar comes out. Light comes in and oxygen comes out. Light goes in and CO2 goes in. And we're not going to worry so much about all the details of what's going on in between there. But let's first think about the units of light intensity. Remember that from somewhere back in physics or somewhere along the line, you learn this idea about light could be described as either a wave or a particle. We could talk about the wavelength of it, and we can talk about the energy of it and stuff like that. As far as light-dependent reactions in photosynthesis or in biology anywhere are concerned, we don't really care about the energy of the, of the photon. We just care about whether the photon is absorbed or not. So the units we have are quantum units. They're counting photons. And we talked about, when we talked about light intensity and the antenna absorbing photons, we talked about a rain of photons. It's a flux. And that has units of, typically we use micromoles of photons. Per square meter per second. These are the standard units of light intensity that we talk about. And to sort of calibrate things, full sun is about 2,500. Micromoles photons. What's the light intensity in this room now? 1,000. Anybody else want to guess? 100. Anybody else? 20? I can bring my light meter down, but I, I know what it is because I've measured it last time. It's probably about 5. Yeah. And if you went outside right now in the full sun, it might be around 500. This is full sun at the equator when the sun is directly overhead when there's no water vapor in the air. Right? So you're getting, the sun is getting everything through to you that it can. This is the one important take-home message from thinking about light intensity units. Our eyes are very poor light meters. They're very bad at judging the intensity of light. And you know this from a practical experience. You can take a book and go out in moonlight. And you might not be able to see the colors of the pictures, but you can read the black and white words, no problem. Moonlight is 0 0.01 micromoles photons per square meter per second. Full sun is 2,500. That means your eyes are working over five orders of magnitude of light intensity. And you know how they do that. You've got this little thing that iris that opens and closes, right? Bright light, it closes down. Dark, dim light, it opens up. Okay? So our eyes are adapted to be able to work over a wide range of light intensities. Therefore, they're not very good at distinguishing differences in light intensity. It's very easy to be misled. So we had guesses of from 20 to 100 to 1,000 when it, the light intensity in this room, typically room light with fluorescent lights in the room is on the order of 5 micromoles photons. Not very bright. Okay, good. So this just gives you some idea about the range of units that we need to be concerned with. Now, one other thing we need to think about is how those photons are used. So 
what we're looking at here is the solid line represents the absorption spectrum of a leaf. Just how much of the light that hits the leaf is being absorbed. The dashed line represents the action spectrum. That could be, for example, measuring oxygen evolution as a function of wavelength. Right? So in the blue, we get lots of oxygen evolution. In the green, we don't get much. Back in the red, we get more. Not, not unexpected, because in the blue and the red part of the spectrum is where the chlorophylls absorb. If we take the ratio of those, the photons that are absorbed and the photons that are used to produce oxygen, we get this thing called the quantum yield, or the quantum efficiency. We already have an idea of what this number is, because remember, the slope of that curve in the Emerson and Arnold experiment was around 9 to 10 photons per oxygen evolved. So the maximum quantum yield is about 0.1 oxygens per photon. That's the reciprocal of 10 photons per oxygen. And you'll notice that this quantum yield is pretty constant over most of the spectrum, even sort of in the blue and or the green and yellow part of the spectrum. There's a little dip here. But basically, 80 to 90 percent of the photons that are absorbed anywhere in this wavelength range are used effectively in photosynthesis. So it doesn't matter what the wavelength is. It only matters whether it's absorbed or not. That's why we use phone energy, sorry, we use photon units to measure light intensity and not energy units. Because there certainly is twice as much energy in a blue photon as in a red photon. But this tells us blue photons are no more effective at driving photosynthesis than red photons are. Or actually, green or yellow photons. This little dip here is because there are some carotenoids that absorb light energy in chloroplasts but can't use that energy to do photosynthesis. They do other things with it. So basically, between 400 and 680 nanometers, this curve is pretty flat. Any photon that's absorbed will be used in photosynthesis. It just matters whether it's absorbed or not. OK. So basically what we want to do for most of the lecture today is think about how plants respond to variations in light intensity. And we're going to think about this on time scales from variations of light intensity that might be on the time scale of a few seconds. Think about a leaf on a tree on a windy day. If you watch that leaf, it's doing this, right, in the wind. So if the sun's over here, at one point it's facing towards the sun and getting lots of light. The next second it might be facing away for edge onto the sun and getting much less light. So there's variations that occur on that sort of time scale. If you think about sun flex, that is, in, if there's a canopy of trees overhead, there are spots where the sun gets through without hitting a leaf, a little bright spot on the ground. If that sun fleck hits a leaf, then that leaf's going to get a lot of light for the few minutes as the sun moves across the sky that the sun fleck is hitting that leaf. We have clouds. It can be bright and sunny now, a half an hour later, or even five minutes later, a cloud can go by. So there's changes in light intensity associated with clouds. There's changes in light intensity with the sun going across the sky. It's low intensity early in the morning, brightest at noon, low intensity again at night. There's changes in light intensity according to the seasons, right? More sun in the summertime than in the wintertime. So there are many different time scales on which light intensity changes. And what we want to think about is how do plants respond to these changes in light intensity? And on what time scales do we need to be thinking about this? OK, so let's start off with one where let's imagine a plant that is living at the bottom of a forest canopy, so it's mostly in the shade, versus a leaf from the top of the canopy that's seeing mostly sun. We want to compare the characteristics of those leaves. If we look at the sun leaf, what we typically see is a thicker leaf with a lot more mesophyll cells. So here's the lower epidermis, up at the top is the upper epidermis. Everything in between there are photosynthetic cells. In a sun leaf, there are lots more cells than in a shade leaf. A shade leaf is thinner. Why does that make sense? Why does it make sense that a sun leaf has more cells than a shade leaf? 
Yeah, basically, there's more, more photons there. And those photons, if it's brighter light, they can penetrate further down into the leaf. And these cells down at the bottom here can s still do photosynthesis. Where if you, put, uh, if you put this leaf in the shade, the cells at the bottom here wouldn't get enough light to be able to do photosynthesis. Okay, so we would expect, as simply as a result of looking at the morphology of a sun leaf versus a shade leaf, if you put them in bright light, which one can do more photosynthesis in bright light, the sun leaf or the shade leaf? Sun leaf, right? It's got more photosynthetic machinery, right? It should be able to do more. So we'll come back to that in just a second. So this is a response that happens at the level of a leaf. Let's imagine that if you take a plant that's grown in the shade and we move it out into the sun, will the shade leaves turn into sun leaves? No. no. The answer is no. So once a leaf is formed, its characteristics are dictated by the light environment at the time the leaf is formed. But the new leaves that form on that shade plant that we move out into the sun, the new leaves will have sun characteristics. Okay? So it's during development that these characteristics are determined. They can't switch back and forth. So it tells you that these sun shade characteristics are something that is fixed in the leaf at the time the leaf develops. So that gives you the time scale of adaptation here is responses on the time scale of days that it takes a leaf to, de to develop. Okay. Some other responses to sunlight. Oh, sorry. So. You're talking about the adaptation um, on the time scale of that single leaf to develop? Yep. So it's not like genetically in the plant for, for like all the leaves? Good question. So is it genetically in the plant? Yes, but... In what sense? Like, I guess there's a limitation on how it can change, which is... Important. Yeah, right? So if, if under certain external conditions it can make a sun leaf, and under different external conditions it makes a shade leaf, is, those, is the responses to those two different extremes of the environment encoded in the DNA? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? So it's not a change in the DNA. It's a change in the way the organism is responding to its environment. Again, limited by its DNA. Basically, starting in about three lectures, that's what we're going to spend the rest of the semester talking about. How do plants sense their environment and respond to it? And how do what's encoded in the DNA dictate the range of that response? Right? That's what's going on here. Well, that's what's going on here. Right? Developmental differences that are triggered by external signals that lead to differences in gene expression. Right? To make more cells, you have, there has to be something that's controlling cell division that makes thicker leaves. Right? And we'll, we'll look at the details of that. Okay, another, another thing that can help plants adapt to variations in light are leaf movements. So you all have, if you have house plants, and you put the plant next to a window, right? The leaves face towards the window. You turn the plant and a couple of days later, the leaves have moved back. These are called heliotropic movements. Some plants, it takes several days. Some plants, like sunflowers, sunflowers, they track the sun every day. They move back and forth with the sun, okay? So, this, this is, again, a response to changing environment, but this is happening on time scales of hours for most plants. Now, I know that um, in the textbook it mentions that it's blue light that these plants are responding to. If you change the intensity of red light, the plants, the leaves will change. Why just blue light instead of red light? We're going to learn in a couple of lectures, the plants have two basic light receptors, one that absorbs blue light and one that absorbs red light. How often does a plant see only blue light with no red light? Never. 
How often does a plant see only red light with no blue light? Only one condition. Deep shade. If the leaves above you are absorbing most of the red light, then blue, red, and blue light, the only thing that's coming down is actually sort of far red light, longer wavelength red. So most of the time, under normal conditions, plants are seeing proportional amounts of blue and red light. So if a plant responds to blue light, it doesn't matter. Right? It's responding automatically to red light as well, even though there's no red light receptor, or vice versa. OK. So these heliotropic movements are driven by water changes, cells at the base of the leaf that take up water or release water that make them more turgid or less turgid that allows the leaf to turn like this. Another one, interesting one, one that actually we study in my lab, is chloroplast movements in response to light. If you look, we're, what we're looking at now is across, uh, looking at the, the section of the leaf right across here, the top of the palisade cells right underneath the upper epidermis. So this picture represents a thin section of the leaf. And it's looking at the distribution of chloroplasts. And in many plants, in the dark, the chloroplasts are sort of uniformly distributed. If you put them in dim light, the chloroplasts remain pretty uniformly distributed at the top of the cells. If you put them in bright light, the chloroplasts move in dim light, there's the chloroplasts are up here. In bright light, the chloroplasts are along the vertical sides of the cell. In dim light, they're optimizing the exposure of the chloroplasts to the light. Absorb as many photons as possible. In bright light, they're along the edges of the cells, shading each other, decreasing the amount of light on average that each, each chloroplast sees. Can you draw that for a uh, dark? Are darker be, it, darker it's a little bit more, a little harder. So this would be dim. This would be bright. And in many cells in the dark, they're either up here at the top or they're down here at the bottom. Dark is a lot more variable, but dark where the chloroplasts are doesn't really matter because the chloroplasts aren't doing anything as far as light's concerned. It's the dim versus bright that's important. And these time scale, these change on the time scale of 30, 30 minutes or so. You can go between these two forms. Okay, so here's another adaptation of the plants to differences in light intensity. All right. Let's take a much more general view of this and look at basically a michaelis menten curve for light as the substrate for photosynthesis, photons being the substrate, and the function of photosynthetic rate. And we can measure this as CO2 fixation. We can measure it as oxygen evolution. We can measure it as triose phosphate production. Those should all be proportional to each other. Okay? And not surprisingly, it looks just like an enzyme curve. Right? And that tells us that in these regions where the light intensity is low, the rate is relatively linear in light intensity. That means that in this region, the rate of photosynthesis is limited by the availability of substrate, by the availability of photons. So this is referred to as the light-limited region of photosynthesis. Once you get to higher light intensities, the rate of photosynthesis saturates. That's referred to as light-saturated photosynthesis. And one of the key questions that we need to think about from a physiological perspective is the question of what limits photosynthesis at light saturation. It's clearly not photons. There's more photons being absorbed here than can be used to do photosynthesis, which itself has important consequences for the plant. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But what's limiting photosynthesis at high light intensity depends upon the conditions. The book tells you, tells, it's labeled right up there, CO2 limited. Why, would we, why might we consider that photosynthesis would be CO2 limited? What do we know that would make this seem reasonable to us? 
How about Jonathan? What would, why does it make sense that we might think that, C, uh, that photosynthesis is limited by carbon dioxide? You do need it for photosynthesis. Um, where's, where's carbon dioxide used in photosynthesis? Selena, where's carbon dioxide used in photosynthesis? In the Kelvin cycle, right? Rubisco. Does Rubisco have a high affinity or a low affinity for CO2? It's got a low affinity, right? It doesn't bind CO2 very well. So if you increase the CO2 concentration, will you increase the activity of Rubisco? Yeah, probably. So the interesting thing is that if you raise the CO2 concentration, yes, you raise the rate of, of photosynthesis at light in the, in the light-saturated region, but you also raise it here, right? Because remember, if Rubisco is limiting, that means that those products of light reaction, there's, there's no place for them to go. If you add CO2 here, some of this rate is limited by CO2 availability. So really the whole thing is CO2 limited. What did we just talk about that limits photosynthesis at saturating light? Ten minutes ago. We talked about the exchange of triose phosphate and inorganic phosphate between the cytoplasm and the chloroplast. Under normal conditions, light-saturated photosynthesis is limited by the availability of phosphate in the cytoplasm to exchange with triose phosphate from the chloroplast. It's a simple experiment. There are compounds that you can add to cells that rapidly release phosphate in the cytoplasm, and the rate of photosynthesis immediately goes up. So under normal circumstances, light-limited photosynthesis, sorry, light-saturated photosynthesis is not primarily limited by CO2. It's limited by the regeneration of inorganic phosphate in the cytoplasm that can be exchanged for triose phosphate coming out. So let's imagine we're down in this part of the curve. And the light intensity is, let's say, 50. And the light intensity goes up to 100. On what time scale will the rate of photosynthesis respond to that? Are we talking about seconds, minutes, or hours? What would you guess? Yeah, it's on seconds to minutes in that sort of time scale. So moving along this curve really just represents changes in the activity of enzymes associated with all the processes in photosynthesis. That happens pretty rapidly. Okay, so we've got time scales of seconds, changes in light intensity going on here, time scales of minutes, chloroplast movements in the cells, time scales of hours to days, heliotropic movements, and time scales of leaf development for sunshade adaptation. Okay? So we've covered pretty much all of the relevant ranges except for sort of seasonal things and obviously evolutionary things. And we'll get to the evolutionary things in just a minute. Wait, Amy. So CO2 is actually not limiting and only phosphorus? Uh, phosphorus? No, CO2 limits at all light intensities, not just at high light intensity. So if we did a curve like this, let's draw a picture. If we did the curve at ambient CO2, and then we doubled the amount of CO2, it would raise the rate of photosynthesis at light saturation, but it'll also raise the rate of photosynthesis at li under light limiting conditions. So it's not just at light saturation that CO2 is limiting, it's limiting throughout. Yes? Limiting factor explanation. You know what I mean? Like they, what they say in the book that there's only the, there's only one thing that's limiting at the same time. Yeah. Do you agree or disagree with 
No, that's, I, there's not one thing, under most conditions, there's not one thing that completely limits. So this tells you that CO2 is a limiting factor throughout. We also ex explained that, that phosphate exchange is a limiting factor. It can also be, particularly under chilling conditions, the rate at which RUBP, the acceptor thing that works with Revisco along with CO2, the rate at which that regeneration happens can be limiting. So the textbook talks about three different processes that can limit photosynthesis. CO2, phosphate regeneration, and RUBP regeneration. Unfortunately, they label this curve as showing only CO2 limitation. And what I want you to recognize is CO2 limits under all conditions. But there are other things that can be more important in regulating photosynthesis. Because CO2 concentrations aren't going to change. Well, on a uh, climate change sort of scale they will. But on short time scales, they typically don't change. Okay? So this, this label of CO2 limitation on this graph is misleading. That's what I want you to come away with. And you should be able to explain the triose phosphate, phosphate translocator's role in limitation of photosynthesis as well. So the graph is wrong? The graph is the right shape. What's wrong is labeling that CO2 is limiting only in light saturation. CO2 limits through at all light intensities. If you increase the CO2, the rate here will go up as well. Simply because per absorbed photon, once you make ATP and NADPH, the amount of CO2 fixation that can happen is a function of CO2 concentration, right? Because Rubisco is so CO2 limited. Okay. So let's go on to compare curves like this for plants that are grow grown in bright light versus plants that are grown in shade. All right? So we'll start on this side of the graph and look at two different plants, a plant that grows in full sun versus a plant that grows in deep shade. One characteristic that jumps out at you right away, we've already talked about, the fact that at high light intensity, the sun plant can do more photosynthesis than the shade plant. Why did we say that was the case? Say that again. Yeah, it's basically got more, more photosynthetic machinery, more cells that can do photosynthesis, right? So that means there's more reaction centers and more electron transport stuff and more Calvin cycle, more of everything, right? So if you give them more light, they should be able to do more photosynthesis. These guys are being saturated because some process in photosynthesis, probably triose phosphate, phosphate exchange, is limiting. Okay, so that's, that one's easy. If we look at the initial slopes of these curves that represent the efficiency of photosynthesis, it's a little hard to tell there, but they're basically the same. The optimum efficiency of photosynthesis is the same for most plants. But there is a difference here. Notice that the sun plant goes from respiration to photosynthesis. The, this, it's called the compensation point, the point at which respiration just equals to photosynthesis, at a higher intensity than the shade plant. That means that the shade plant can do net photosynthesis at lower light intensities than a sun plant. Is that beneficial? Of course. Why? Why is it that the shade plant can do more photosynthesis at low light intensities than the sun plant? Uh, I think for shade plants, uh, have lower That's right. It's all due to, because the, the slopes of these lines are the same. The difference is because the shade plant has a lower respiration rate than the sun plant. Not surprisingly, shade plant can't make as many products of photosynthesis, right? So it can't burn up as much, otherwise there won't be as, as, as net growth. Right? So that shade plants typically have a substantially lower respiration rate, which means their compensation point is at a lower light intensity than for sun plants. Shade plants can do net photosynthesis at lower light intensity, but the reason has nothing to do with photosynthesis. It has to do with respiration rates, differences in respiration rates. Now let's look at the right-hand graph 
which shows the same phenomenon, but not for two different plants. For the same plant grown in either bright light or dim light. And we see basically the same phenomenon. So what that tells us is this represents adaptations of two different leaves on the same plant. Developmental adaptations to growth in dim light versus bright light. This re represents adaptations of two different types of plants. One that's adapted to growing in shade and one that's adapted to growing in sun. They have the same physiological basis. Differences in respiration rate, same initial slopes, differences in maximum rates. So on an evolutionary time scale, the things that distinguish plants that grow favorably in the sun versus those that grow favorably in the shade are the same adaptations that happen in different leaves on the same plant that develop in the shade versus the sun. That's important. You should be thinking about why that makes sense. Adaptation on time scales of days over development of leaves are the same sorts of adaptations that happen that have been selected for on an evolutionary scale for plants that if you look at their normal habitats would be growing in full sun versus plants that would normally be growing in full shade. Okay. So one of the things that we talked about when we looked at this photosynthesis versus the radiance curve. We often refer to these as PI curves. Photosynthesis versus light intensity. We said that once you get up here to light saturation, photons are now in excess. More photons are being absorbed than what photosynthesis can use because photosynthesis is saturated. So let's look at this in a slightly different way. Let's plot on the y-axis, we're going to plot either the rate at which photons are used in photosynthesis, that's what this line is here, or the rate of photon absorption, that's this line here. So down here in this light limited region, for every photon that's absorbed, you get some constant fraction of photosynthesis. The slope of this line would be something around 0 0.1. 0 0.1 oxygens per photon absorbed. That's the maximum efficiency that we can get from photosynthesis. What this means though, as we get out approaching light saturation, the rate of photon utilization in photosynthesis saturates. But the rate of photon absorption continues to increase. And this curve is linear to several orders of magnitude light intensity higher than full sun. Okay, so the over physiological range, the rate of light absorption by the leaf is linear in light intensity. The rate of light utilization in photosynthesis saturates. So these photons underneath this curve are being used for photosynthesis. These photons in this shaded represent excess absorbed light energy. Photons that are absorbed by the plant but can't be used for photosynthesis because the process of photosynthesis is saturated. And this is bad. I mentioned, I think at the beginning of the photosynthesis lecture, that the most dangerous biological compound known is chlorophyll in the presence of light and oxygen. Did I say that? Yeah, okay. So why is that the case? If chlorophyll, when it absorbs a photon, forms an excited state, we'll designate the excited state by this, well, it's not a very good looking asterisk, by an asterisk here. This is excited state. Normally, we like these excited states to be used to drive photosynthesis, right, through the light reactions. But if there's excess excited states, photons that are being absorbed that can't be used in photosynthesis, then this excited state can react with oxygen to produce an excited state of oxygen. It's called singlet oxygen, 
Singlet oxygen is fairly reactive, particularly with double bonds in molecules. So lipids that have double bonds in it are very susceptible to singlet oxygen. The other thing that can happen is remember that, that the reaction centers push electrons out into electron carriers. If photosynthesis is light saturated, what's going to be the redox state of those electron carriers? Are they going to be oxidized or reduced? They're going to be reduced. So any electron carrier that's reduced can also react with molecular oxygen to produce the superoxide radical. It's a free radical. And free radicals are pretty reactive and can damage all sorts of proteins. So both singlet oxygen and superoxide are things that form not very much under light limited conditions because all those excited states and all those electron carriers are functioning in photosynthesis. But when excess light is being absorbed, the formation of these reactive oxygen species often referred to as ROS. Excess light absorption leads to the formation of reactive oxygen species, which themselves can damage the photosynthetic machinery. So in the light reactions part of the book, it mentioned damage to photosystem 2. And damage to photosystem 2 occurs primarily under excess light conditions when these reactive oxygen species are being produced. Okay? So it shouldn't be too surprising that, first of all, plants have things to deal with singlet oxygen and superoxide, things that protect the plant against reactive oxygen species. So things like uh, ascorbic acid, glutathione, there's a whole bunch of enzymes that deal with these things. We'll talk more about this um, actually in the last lecture when we talk about plant stress responses. But the thing I want to mention briefly, and this is the part of photosynthesis that I've spent most of my career working on, is it would make sense that rather than allowing these reactive oxygen species to form, that when these excess excited states form, to get rid of them is heat. Just give that energy up as heat rather than letting these reactions happen. Okay. This is a group of reactions referred to as photoprotection. And basically what happens in photoprotection is somehow, in a very interesting way that I won't go into detail about, the plant can sense the fraction of absorbed photons that are in excess of what can be used in photosynthesis and get rid of those by dissipating that energy as heat. And this is a very closely regulated process. And if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense. Because if you dissipated too much of the absorbed energy, then you'd be cutting into the plant's ability to do photosynthesis. It wouldn't be able to compete as well with its neighbors. If you dissipate too little, then you have reactive oxygen species being produced, and that's going to be detrimental to the plant. So it's not surprising that there's been a lot of selective pressure over evolutionary time to get a process that balances this perfectly. And that perfect balance really does happen. Less than 1% variation between the photons that are being absorbed and the photons that are in excess. And so down here, you only need to dissipate a little of excess energy. Out here, you need to dissipate a lot. Right? And that's very precisely controlled and controlled on time scales of seconds or less. So it's fast. So for example, the sunfleck problem. Right? If, uh, if um, as the sun moves, if bright light suddenly hits a leaf that's been in the dark, that sun is able to adapt to that excess light absorption on time scale of a second or so. It doesn't take very long. Okay, I'm just going to give you one more detail about this 
one that's given in the book. And it has to do with a carotenoid called zeaxanthin. It was known for quite a while that if you look at zeaxanthin content over the course of a day, zeaxanthin is low early in the morning, is highest at noon, and goes down again at night. And basically what's happening is another carotenoid called violaxanthin is high at night, low at noon, high again at night. These two are being interconverted. If we expose the plant early in the morning artificially to high light, the zeaxanthin content would go up and the violaxanthin content would go down. So increasing zeaxanthin content is a response not to high light, but to excess light. And without, I'm not going to go into any of the gory details of mechanisms, but it is this zeaxanthin that is responsible for dumping that energy in the antenna as heat. The zeaxanthin and the violaxanthin are in the same antenna protein complexes that the chlorophylls are that are transferring the energy to the reaction center. So basically, this zeaxanthin represents an alternative sink for excited states in the antenna. When light is in excess, this zeaxanthin dumps the energy as heat, so it minimizes the formation of these reactive oxygen species. When light is limiting, the zeaxanthin goes away, and this process doesn't happen, and all the excited states are used to drive photosynthesis. So this balance is being sensed somehow in the amount of zeaxanthin that's present. Jenna. Um, do all plants do this? Yep. Um, all plants, so algae. Is it evolved from one time or many times? Um, it appears it probably evolved one time back well before chloroplasts existed. It existed when there were unicellular prokaryotic algae, because they do the same, not exactly the same thing, but something very similar. Something very similar. So this is something that evolved more than, probably more than two million years ago. And what we're seeing are evolutionary variants of this in different phylogenetic lines of, of photosynthetic organisms. Yes? Two billion years ago? Two billion years ago, yeah. So photosynthesis, f the first photosynthetic organisms were thought to have evolved around three and a half billion years ago. Pretty early in, in was, um, photosynthesis evolved pretty early. And the, and the ability to do this was present in photosynthetic organisms that have phycobilisomes. Those are organisms that make up, if you know your geology, stromatolites. They're, they're basically bacterial mats that were um, fossilized, and the oldest ones are about 2.7 billion years old. And those guys, those guys now, the closest ancestors of those, are capable of doing this light regulation stuff. Okay, so a key here. We think of a graph like this primarily in the context of changing light intensity. Let's imagine on a day like this in the summertime that the light is constant. So we're sitting here at, let's say, around 200. Okay, So maybe two-thirds of the light energy is being used for photosynthesis and a third is being dissipated. Let's imagine the light intensity is constant, but over the course of the day, the soil is drying out. The stomates close. What's going to happen to the rate of photosynthesis as the stomates closed? It's going to go down. Has the light intensity changed? Has the amount of light energy that's in excess changed? Yes, anything that decreases the amount of photosynthesis will increase the amount of excess light energy. And this is why the stuff that we study in my lab is so important. It's not just changes in light intensity that affect formation of reactive oxygen species. If you water stress the plants, the stomates close, it can't do as much photosynthesis. If you temperature stress the plants, too warm or too cold, can't do as much photosynthesis. If you nitrogen stress the plants, we haven't talked about it, but the plants do less photosynthesis when you nitrogen stress them, well you know why, they can't make as much rubisco, right? 
Virtually any stress you put on a plant decreases its ability to do photosynthesis and therefore increases the, capacity, the, or the amount of the potential for formation of reactive oxygen species. And the plant responds by dissipating more of this light energy. So this is a common thread that links together most types of stress in plants, even though those stress may have nothing to do with changes in light intensity. Okay. So we didn't quite finish here. Let's at least start talking about a little bit about CO2, and we'll finish this up at the beginning of the next lecture. This is a graph that's showing the rate of photosynthesis, now not as a function of light intensity, but as a function of CO2 concentration. And showing this, this is the external, the ambient CO2 concentration. It's showing this for C3 plants and C4 plants. So a couple things that we should notice. At low CO2 concentrations, C4 plants can do more photosynthesis than C3 plants. Why? Yeah, right? So Rubisco in C3 plants has got a very poor affinity for CO2. But the thing that captures CO2 in, in C4 plants, remember, is PEP carboxylase. It's got a much higher affinity for CO2. So the CO2 compensation points, the place at which the net CO2 assimilation crosses the zero line. So down here, this would be CO2 production associated with respiration. The CO2 compensation point is much lower for C4 plant than C3 plant. Right? This obviously has all sorts of physiological implications for how these plants grow. If we look at the same thing for internal CO2 concentration, we measure inside the leaf. We see that the CO2 concentration inside the C4 leaf is really low compared to outside. What does that mean as far as the gradient for CO2 to enter the leaf? It's a big gradient in C4 plants. How about C3 plants? Here's the compensation point for in interior CO2, exterior CO2. Virtually the same. Rubisco cannot by itself produce much of a gradient for CO2 to get in. Right? That's why C4 plants can do photosynthesis with their stomates closed, and C3 plants have to have their stomates open. It's because PEP carboxylase has a much higher affinity for CO2. It can draw that internal, in internal CO2 concentration down much more. Okay, one last thing, then we'll finish. Notice out here, at high CO2 concentrations, C3 plants do more photosynthesis than C4 plants. Why? Why at high CO2 do C3 plants do more photosynthesis than C4 plants? Mm, that potentially could be part of it, but it's, it turns out not to be that important. There's something more straightforward than that. Uh, that could be, that's, a, that's another reasonable answer, but not correct. Stephen. Yeah, that's basically it. So does C4 cost more energy to do than C3? Right? Two extra ATP, right? So in C4 plants out here, it's still spending those two extra ATP, even though it doesn't need to. There's plenty of CO2. In the C3 plants, how much photorespiration is happening at high CO2 concentrations? Not very much. So at high CO2 concentrations, CO, uh, C3 plants actually can do better than C4 plants. And so take this idea with you in the beginning of the next lecture. We'll do the last little bit of this that answers the question that so many of you asked. Why do C3 plants exist at all? Right? Doesn't, why haven't C4 plants outcompeted them everywhere? Because there must be certain environmental conditions under which C3 photosynthesis is more efficient than C4 photosynthesis. Right? And the textbook talks about it. We'll review that very briefly at the beginning of next lecture, and then we'll go on to talk about phloem transport.